and welcome to another edition of the All Angels Podcast. I am I feel lucky enough to be joined by the future voice of the Los Angeles Angels, Darren Sutton. How are you doing tonight? I'm great, my friend. I came on late. Thank you. I usually am not late. <laughs> I'm doing what you I was doing what you're doing now, and we had tech problems. So thank you for your patience. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, I, I would be lying to you if we never had any kind of technical difficulties on our <laughs> end. So I, I completely understand how that works. So um, like I mentioned, uh, voice of the angels, the new voice. How did you get into play by play? I know you have a history, obviously, in baseball with your dad and then your own kind of baseball path. But how did you decide to uh, get into play by play? So it's interesting. I, I kind of always loved it. And being a Southern Californian, you know what the what the announced scene looks like. Um, Ross Porter, I was best friends with his son, Wes, when I was a young and I mean, very young, like elementary school age. So I hung out all the time at Ross's house. He was like my second dad still is. But what I didn't realize is I was watching preparation front and center. I was watching a man prepare for his craft and I loved it. I was very intrigued by it. And then listening to my father's journey shared by Ross and of course the legend Vin Scully. I was always at that age very intrigued. As I got older, I enjoyed sharing words with people. I enjoyed not as much, I'm more introverted in my personal life, but I enjoyed doing the PA for the basketball team rather than playing for the basketball <laughs> team. Baseball was the only sport I would prefer to play early on rather than hop behind a microphone, but I loved it more and more and more. And I ended up, you know, we went to a faith based school, so I'd get up and speak some at school. And to the point where it started to become my dream. Now I played a little bit. And because that was a legacy, I got a chance to play professionally. If my last name wasn't Sutton, there's no way that ever would have happened. And I'm fine with that. It was a unique right. experience. But all the while, I was hoping to get this chance. And so even when I played one year in the Jayhawk League, which is kind of a lower tier below the Cape Cod League in Kansas, I would pitch and every fifth day on a team in Kansas. And then the other four days, I did play-by-play -play on radio. Oh, wow. And so I was learning my craft, trying to get better at it. My father was then in the business, so I was learning from Pete Van Weren and from Skip Carey. And they always had time for me when I was in college. So I hoped and I dreamt that I could do it. I had six years at CNN that I loved every second of because I learned the journalism side of things. Mm -hmm. I learned the editing content creation side of things before there were smartphones and the internet. Um, and then I finally got my break with, with the angels doing full-time yeah. play by play. Um, so that's kind of how my journey started. A lot of little stops along the way, minor league baseball in Jacksonville play by play in 94, but big picture. Um, you know, I kind of got my break with the Braves a little bit and then truly with the angels on radio. And you mentioned some names, especially like Vince Scully stood out to me. You're like, you're absolutely right with, with your dad's time in LA. How was that? How was, and I, I got, what point did you realize this is Vince Scully or was he always just kind of, oh yeah, he calls the Dodger games. Uh, I think the more I wanted to do it, the more I realized it, if that right. makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the more I realized it's almost like watching my father play. I mean, when you're 12, you don't get how difficult it is. Even if you're playing with your buddies in a league, when you're 17 and thinking about the draft, then you do get what it's like. And it's the same thing with Vinny. Um, you take him for granted. We all did, you know, and even my predecessors here like Victor, we, we take guys like that for granted because they're good storytellers. They're in their delivery. They're prepared. They're peaceful. And Vinny was the highest level of that. And so um, certainly as I got older and wanted to do it, I appreciated him more. And then even more so where it's like you feel this big in the visiting broadcast booth where Vinny's this big when right. I was calling Brewers or Diamondbacks. But yet I was honored to be, you know, one wall away from one of the greatest voices in the history of the sport. That's so cool. Yeah. Like you mentioned, one of the best voices ever in baseball. Um, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but your time with the Angels this is like your second go around with the Angels. Your first time, uh, I believe, it was oh, uh, 2000, 2001. Um, and now you get brought back uh, in a TV role before it was on the radio. How does it feel to be back in Anaheim and, and kind of not go full circle, but just, you know, be back? Well, in a, in a weird way, it is full circle because it was my team in high school when my father played there. It was, uh, you know, I, I kind of understood the game most when I was a Capistrano Valley Christian baseball player, student, <laughs> driving up I-5 to the Big A, helping out in the clubhouse where, where I could. So it kind of became my favorite team when I was away from the game. Certainly, I took on the Braves a little bit as my favorite team because my father was there. But all the while, the Angels were my favorite team. Then getting a job to do radio for two years, I don't know that they were or weren't my favorite team because I was nervous, overwhelmed, and excited 
just to get started in the big leagues. Now I have a few more laps around the track, albeit a brand new learner every single day. I'm able to smell the roses a little bit more. This is a majority of my life, my favorite team. Um, uh, you know, with them not going where they want to go the last couple of years, I've been right there with them with buddies, texting, yeah. l lamenting the frustrating times, <laughs> enjoying the good times, wondering what moves would be made, you know, talking about trade this piece, trade that piece, we get this back, buddies going back and forth. That's kind of fun now that I get to actually jump and grab a press pass and get back on the other side with the Angels. Um, I'm really humbled by that. And I, I don't know that I've ever had a job, you know, I can't say with the Diamondbacks, I can't say with the Brewers, and even early with the Angels, where I'm kind of fan, fan and broadcaster for the team. So I'll have to work on that because <laughs> the two can't always mix, you know, you, right. you, the two can't always mix because great play by an opposing player is great play by an opposing player. And I want to make sure that's always pointed out. So um, yeah, I, I'm excited to come full circle. This is my baseball home, no doubt. And that's really cool to hear you, you know, like wanting to come back to, and 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 do this with the Angels. What was the process this time? Did did you reach out to, you know, obviously Victor stepped away and, and is doing his the minor league thing. So did you reach out and say, hey, I would be interested if, you know, if you want, if I could take an interview or did they approach you? How did that all start? Oh, it was definitely me first. I, yeah. I made the first reach out. I don't know what they were thinking. You know, I, I could be, <laughs> you know, high on myself to think maybe I popped into their head. I, I'm. I would never, ever take that for granted, and it probably might not have been the case, but the moment the job opened up, everybody I knew, and I had had a fresh back and forth with the organization. I had actually um, sent an email to John Carpino letting him know September-ish. Um, I'm at the point in my life, I'm an empty nester, John, I shared with him, <laughs> um, and I've enjoyed these last six or seven years you know, with Perfect Game, with amateur baseball. We've Heck, today, as we talk right now, we finally launched our app. We have a full-blown streaming network that I was a part, helped develop. Um, I said, but that being said, John, you know, being an empty nester, having things come full circle in my life, I'd love to come back if, if you ever have an opportunity. And he politely responded very quickly, which to me was encouraging. The response was very encouraging. We don't anticipate any changes in the broadcast situation, but thank you for reaching out. Well, when I heard about Victor, I actually was able to take that exact same email chain and respond back months later okay. and say, respectfully, um, now you do. Uh, and I don't know where you plan on going, but I'd love to be considered. That's all I'm asking is I'd love to be considered. I texted Joe Madden. Um, he and I, since I was there the first time, have always kept in touch, bump into him personally. We've done charitable events together understanding that that's not his responsibility at all, the, the broadcaster. But right. hey, if you have anything to say, anything <laughs> you'd work. like to share, yeah, anything, <laughs> please share it on my behalf if you're comfortable. If not, I understand. And then I got to know, you know, the the leaders, John Hefner over at uh, Fox Sports West, which is switching over to Bally's. Right. Uh, Mitch, Mitch Reagan, who is the team's game director, such an amazing director, was my director in Milwaukee, was my director in Arizona. So that's a resource, right? So mm -hmm. you, you ask, hey, do you have any ideas who I need to reach out to? So I, 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 I touched base with as many people as I could. Then I just stepped back because there's only so much you need to do at that point. Um, and as the process rolled out, I was given the opportunity to do uh, a demo. I was thrilled because, you know, they, they kind of retreated all of them. Angels, Fox, talked for quite a, quite a while. And then I don't know who else. And I know I wasn't alone. There were, you know, a handful of us got an opportunity to do a demo with Gooby and Boy, was I giddy. And I think my attitude was that if I get this, after not calling full-time games or even a portion of a schedule since 2012, if I get this, like, I'm so satisfied. As a person of faith, I was very satisfied and prayerfully grateful. Um, and we had fun in the demo. I called him. We talked for 40 minutes a day before, and I got to know him even better. Um, it was a part of a game last year um, when Trout set the club home run record. And okay, so, yeah. It was, yeah, it was a portion of that game. And we called it together. We had some pitching involved. Uh, Griff Canning was involved in that. And, and then, obviously, a, a full half inning. And then, again, I stepped back and waited um, until I got the word that uh, I was one of two. They didn't tell me. They didn't want to tell me yet. I think they were working it out with Matt at the time. And, man, was I thrilled to hear it was Matt. And so I've been walking on clouds ever since, certainly. It's been a lot of fun. When you're doing those demo things, I think that's pretty interesting, too, because like you said, it's an older game, a game that's already happened. You might have already seen it, actually, especially with the history behind, you know, Trout passing Sam. Do you have to, like, 
not try to predict if like you know what when it's coming so yeah how do you take yourself and be like okay let's act like i have no idea that he's gonna hit a home run on this next pitch well here's the funny thing they shared with me the video should i wanted to watch it Mm -hmm. and all i watched were the elements in other words we did like more of an open type situation and you know the bump back from break where there's a sponsored element i'm sure they wanted to see me interact with mark and how Mm -hmm. i would lead him to an area I didn't watch any of the other rest of it. I didn't okay. watch any of it. I didn't, I didn't even watch it at all. I filled out a score sheet. I wish I could find it. It'd be fun to, to show it to you. Um, I actually filled out a score sheet. And the, what I did do, excuse me, was I went on baseball reference and kept score because we picked it up basically in the third inning. Okay. I kept score to all the things that had happened up to the third inning without watching you know, my edit. Mm-hmm. off of reference so that when a guy walked up, hey, flied out deep to right field back in the third inning. It was just kind of that flow. But I, I'll be honest with you. I knew Mike was going to hit his homer. I had no idea when it was going to happen. Right. I don't even know that I loved the call of it. But <laughs> um, but he did hit it. You know, I think I was reminded watching it and watching it on a screen like we're watching it now. It's a different mm-hmm. kind of call than having it out in front of you. Right. Um, but I think I was reminded in kind of getting to call that homer how amazing his his foul line to foul line power was because if memory serves even watching that it wasn't like your classic homer where his hands get through the zone and it's going that way um stunned me but anyway it was a wonderful experience and i thought if if this is all i'm going to get to do this would be great but uh fortunately um you know it was enough to to earn the opportunity that sounds really cool just to go back and kind of you know as a kid i remember doing that like kind of uh, as the game's on, you kind of put it down so you can kind of do play by play yourself. So to, to have it like for like a job interview, that it seems like uh, something really cool. So you kind of mentioned Gooby. Um, you guys are going to have you, Gooby, um, and then Jose Moda also in the booth, a three man booth. Have you ever done a three man booth? And, and if so, what are some of the differences between that and, and a two man? So one of the main places I've done it, and it's not been on a nightly basis, is each and every year we play the Perfect Game All American Classic, and it's on MLB Network. We have, you know, Perfect Games, great scout, vice president, uh, player development, David Ronsley, player personnel, David Ronsley, who's a 30-year scout. He's right next to me, and he's outstanding. And we've had anyone from Trevor Hoffman to Dan O'Dowd to Craig Biggio, you know, fill in the blanks. We've had that that traditional analyst. And I love it. I, I love it because I think there are more ideas. And look, you've listened this spring. Jose mm-hmm. Moda is calling games yeah. like it's nobody's business. So – the comfort level there, if those two take off for a little while and they want to go dancing, I'll enjoy the dance. I'll listen very closely. I'll listen very closely um, and then add what I, what I should be adding. I played a little bit too. You know, my father played a little bit too. And so, but I'm excited about it. It's only a good thing. Where I think you 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 might suffer or struggle is if, you know, and I'm working on my, my season prep here, but if, you know, if, if you have all your, your season prep, right, and you feel so married to it, that you lose sight of the fact that you're having a, a, I always talk about it. It's a four person conversation. So if me, like, let's say you're the, you're the only viewer watching, which won't happen. We hope, <laughs> <I> hope not. <laughs> but, but let's, uh, here's how I, here's how I've always viewed it, especially with a three person booth. It's me, Mark, Jose, you, and whether it's a hot tea or a cold beer or a scotch and soda, it doesn't matter. We're all having a beverage and we're all watching the game together. There's no way that I'm not going to be inclusive in that conversation. Mm-hmm. Not a good one anyway. Not a good one. <laughs> um, so for me, I love it. I love baseball. I love being around my buddies. I love talking baseball. These two dudes, major league hitter, major league pitcher, both could call games by themselves anyway. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's just an amazing thing. We're fortunate, Matt and I, and obviously we know Matt could actually like host Jimmy Kimmel if he wanted to. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> But but Matt and I are very fortunate to have such a such a, a deep set of resources each and every night. So the Angels, you know, throughout the last handful of years that I remember, have always um, had like themed weekends, whether it's you know halfway to Christmas or '80s or you know country weekend. And your uh, partner in the booth, um, Mark Gubza, likes to dress up. Is there any way we are going to possibly see you uh, in some kind of a costume this year? There have been times throughout my career when I have been asked to tone it down and tone it down quite a bit. I will welcome that opportunity. (laughs) I will welcome that opportunity to have fun because let's remind ourselves, right? As you and I talk now, we're not trying to find a cure for what's gone on over the last year in our world. We're not trying to to stretch economics and make it fit for a senior citizen's home or cure cancer. It's a baseball game, man. 
And so if you can't have fun with it, uh, if you can't enjoy it, I mean, that's to me what makes him so endearing. Those are kind of creepy, all those pictures, but that's to me <laughs> what makes him so endearing. And I am, I'm not kind of in, all my chips are all in. And I've worked with partners, um, especially when I worked with Mark Grace with the Diamondbacks, who was e exactly the same way. And it makes for a great show. So 100% I'm all in. And I'll follow those leads there, but I may have some other surprises too for them. So I, I'm excited to be a part of it. That's awesome. That's something that's always been fun as a fan watching, you know, uh, Victor and, and Gooby for the last, you know, uh, more than handful of years is that they always kind of played off each other very well that way. So that's great to, to hear that. Now, obviously, with, with COVID happening last year in the 2020 season, the, the broadcasters didn't necessarily travel on the road. They were either in the stadium or um, in their little makeshift booth outside the stadium. What are your plans or what have they told you that you're going to be able to do this year? Are you going to be in Anaheim for at least the home games? Um, or are you going to be able to do it from your house? Because I know you're an Arizona resident. Right. So I'm not doing anything from my house. Um, okay. No way, no how. I'm going to be back, coming back home with family. Obviously, we're going to keep our home here because this yeah. kind of happened at the last minute for all of us <laughs> involved. Um, my wife has a, a real successful career in human resources, and she's a big part of our home. We're a team. So um, she'll come out some. And, you know, when I have a couple of days off, I may fly back. Now, 2022 may look different as far as where our family goes, if you follow me there. Yeah. Um, but we'll piece it together in 2021. But um, when they're at home and whatever is allowed in the seats, I'll be in my seat, you know, calling the game when it's my assigned game. Um, you know, when they're on the road, we won't travel with them this year, but we'll be at the ballpark in a setup. I've heard anywhere from back in the broadcast compound they had last year to maybe sitting in our booth in the same seats where we're calling our home games just with a bunch of monitors in front of us. Either way, um, it's fine with me. So, um, yeah, no remote broadcast in the sense of from our homes. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be at the yard. That's great. That's great to hear. Like, especially with, now with fans coming in, the energy is probably going to be a little bit different. And that's yeah. really cool to kind of to feed off of that compared to, like, last season I kind of understood it because there's no fans in the stands. So it wasn't a lot that, that energy that you're used to. But now that there's at least some, some people in there, um, that's definitely going to be awesome. Uh, you mentioned your your father, obviously uh, Don Sutton, Hall of Famer. Um, played with the California Angels, California Angels. I know a lot of people would love if they went back to that um, in the eighties. Um, what are some of your you know best memories of him? You know, it, with the Angels or just kind of in general, wherever he was during his career. He took me to work. I mean, I mean, he he took me to work, uh, and, and that's really the best way I know to say it. Now there were expectations. Um, I had to be respectful. You know, I was to be seen and not heard. Um, that was his office. You know, it's almost as if a banker takes his son to work. There are standards that go on in that. And it was exactly the same. Now, my father played baseball, so it wasn't like going to a bank with my dad. <laughs> and so I, I will always be grateful for that. We shared baseball so much in common. Um, I never had his skill sets, but I loved the sport. Uh, and as I grew older, I learned that I maybe loved the camaraderie of the sport and the relationships in the sport even more than he did. He loved working hard and being good and being a part of a winning team. He really did. It, it was the end goal. It was the four days of preparation. It was that fifth day. It was the four days of preparation, the fifth day. But he took me to work and I watched it very, very closely. And in losing him this year, I was reminded. I, I already knew it and I always communicated with him. And, you know, but in his passing, it, it, it's almost just a reminder. Hey, man, thank you so much for taking me to work, showing me how to treat people because he treated, you know, the angels as an example. He treated Gene Mock or Mr. Autry the same way as he treated a security guard who guarded the clubhouse door or the man who got him or the woman who got him down on the elevator. He treated people all the same. And I watched him very closely and he busted his butt. He worked really hard with very average stuff to be very, very good. And so for me, um, he took me to work. It was a great example. Now, there's all kinds of stories that spin off of that, that I was able to be there, that I was able to see things behind the scenes. I was playing catch with Brian Downing and Jim Rice during, <laughs> during, during, the, you know, during the ALCS. When the ball sailed over a couple of innings later, I was probably five feet away from Gene Mock when Dave, Dave Henderson's ball sailed out. Um, I was more devastated probably than he was driving home after that game was over. Um, you know, I got to know Donnie more intimately. I loved who he was as a human being. He was super nice to me. He was a super joyful man. I'm always saddened by what happened in the years to follow because I knew him then. 
you know, a couple of chili dogs. I'd make a run for them. I'd make 10 bucks out of the deal in high school. That's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I could remember Bob Boone and Carlton Fisk being 40 plus major league catchers, both catching games against one another. And then back then there being a weight room that's as big as this office. That's all there was in the big leagues. The two of them squatting and bench pressing after the game was over. Wow. So those are the things like that I vividly remember. Um, the hijinks, the things that went on, there's a few moments, certainly some that over the next hopefully 20 years I do this with the team, I'll share. Some will be probably more for private, non-recorded, private conversations. <laughs> right. But there weren't that many of those. I think okay. people dream up kind of what it looks like in that situation. It's not that crazy. And for a young guy, there's a lot to learn. You want to know what real – you want to know what real hard work looks like? Go follow a big league team around all the time. That's what real hard work yeah. looks like. You kind of made the analogy of, you know, like he would take you to work like any other banker or, you know, would. But at what point in your life did you realize my dad's not a banker? He's not like my friend's dad who, you know, goes to work at eight in the morning, comes back at five or whatever. What, what do you remember what age I kind of start sinking in? Like, wow, he's not like, you know, my friend Brad or Brad's dad or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, when I was very young, I got it, but it was this age right here, that graphic you have up when I really got it because I wanted to be him then. I wanted to, I, I understood how hard it was to get people out. I, I, I was working in a situation where I was, you know, pitching, you know, in the Olympic or the Academy League for Capistrano Valley Christian. And then I was later that night kneeling in an on deck circle, looking at 98 from Roger Clemens in an opposing dugout. And so <laughs> I realized this is really, really real. I mean, these are the best in the world. And so for me, that's when I really realized what he did was completely different and appreciated it. I think when you're younger, you think it's really cool. I mean, you right. think it's, and I thought it was cool. I, to this day, to his passing and even beyond, I'll always think it was really cool. And I will never have traded a moment because in the times that he was gone, you know, hey, did you miss, and I, and I hate when people do this, I'm going to do this, sorry. Hey, did you miss your dad when he was, ask your question for you. Um, yeah, yeah, I did, but I had a great set of grandparents that stepped in and helped my mom, and the trade-off was worth it to me. I knew he was doing a job. He also had six months off in the winter time. Right. Um, the trade-off was worth it. Dad was gone, but when dad comes home, I'm going to work with him. And a couple times a year, I actually get to go on a trip with him and stay in a really cool hotel and go to <laughs> other ballparks and listen to other fans. Um yeah, I mean, that's that age right there, like 15, 16, when he was at the A's in 85 and then the Angels in 86 and 87. That's when I really got how different his life and his journey was. That's awesome that you can remember all that right there. That's that's a cool way of putting it. Um, so a little more about you, because you obviously first time on the podcast. We'd like to kind of get the people, uh, get to know them a little better the first time on. So I'm going to ask you, uh, if you had walk-up music this year, what would it be? Oh, wow. Walk of music. Gosh, I've never thought that way. Um, I was such a bad hitter that I never thought about <laughs> walk up music. So I guess I'd have to go straight, you know, mockery, right? Because if, <laughs> if I'll go with George Michael or Wham's Careless Whisper. There's much debate on who actually came up with the song. But we'll go with something that I slow danced to back in prom in 86 and 7. I'll go, I'll go with Careless Whisper. My wife, I'm sure, outside the door is loving hearing that. She thinks that's the best song in the world but uh, i'll go with i'll go with george michael's careless whisper <laughs> i can honestly I got you i got you <laughs> for as far as everyone that i've asked that's definitely a first uh that 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 uh popped up so there there's that um off the field time so obviously um you kind of mentioned it you, you're not doing it full time you and matt are splitting time um so you know there might be some downtime so when you try to get away from the game and just kind of relax what do you find yourself doing more are you a reader are you uh, do you binge watch tv uh, what do you do to get away from it a little bit i love to go on real long walks and whether it be you know in california which is a great walking state you know when you find the beach side or you find a park somewhere or here in scottsdale arizona where he we have paths that would stretch to the moon um, you know, I love to put in podcasts and, and, you know, I got another one to add to my list, but I love to listen to people share. I love to listen to good music, um, and take off or on a bike, you know, for a half day. I really, really love to do that. I love peaceful time. You know, my faith means a lot to me, certainly. And, um, don't ever miss a Sunday or a Saturday, you know, whether it be a vigil mass or, or Sunday, I, I really find peace there. Even out on the road, you know, we're not going to travel with the team this year, but, uh, in my work with Perfect Game, the amateur baseball company, I, I kind of enjoy being in cities like Fort Myers, Florida, or recently I've been in Hoover, Alabama, and, you know, being with another community there as they take time for their worship. So 
I, I kind of found a centering place there. I find a centering place there and family's everything to me. I have two great stepkids. I have two great daughters, all four girls. They're all amazing in different ways and they all have challenges in different ways. And uh, my wife and I really enjoy that responsibility together. They're all out of the house, um, but they're all this close to home because they need us on occasion. So uh, my mom lives in California. Her husband is a great guy, you know, lives in California. My sister lives in California. So uh, family's really everything to me. When I work real hard and, and um, between now two jobs that I have that I love, uh, when I catch a moment, those are some of the things I like to do. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, family's huge, especially um, here, you know, through the podcast or through our social media stuff. We kind of the guys that all of us that run it are all kind of feel the same way about each other, just kind of hanging out with when we can, especially with the with the Angels now season coming up. That's something that we really, uh, really, really love to do. Um, you kind of mentioned that you only really played baseball when you were younger, but now that you're older and you can watch other sports, I don't know how you are as far as watching football, watching other sports, but if you could pick any sport other than baseball to be a professional in, what sport would that be? Basketball, basketball, yeah. basketball, basketball. I was never athletic enough, and I tried to play a little bit because um, I'm six feet five inches tall, but I didn't have the athleticism. But I've been able to call a ton of college basketball on television, and I love it. Uh, I love the camaraderie. I love the trust that players show with one another. But the, the freelance style of athleticism that's a little bit different than baseball, I, I think it's outstanding. And the way the athletes relate with it being 10 instead of 18, you know, playing against one another at the same time. Um, it really isn't that one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, baseball's one-on-one -on -one if you think about it. Everyone right. else gets involved, but it's tennis. It's tennis with defenders behind you. <laughs> and so so basketball, I like, it's truly a crazy team sport, you know, and, uh, and, and so basketball for sure. I've had an amazing time calling. It's been about 15 years, and including this year, a lot of college basketball on TV. So obviously the time of the year it is uh, tournament time. Are you, are you, are you filling out brackets? Are you kind of one of those guys that will sit in front of the TV and watch the games from, you know, sun up to sun down? Like how, how do you handle the, the March madness? In years past, it's different. I'm so glad you asked this question because I got nothing for you right now. I mean, <laughs> absolutely nothing. I'm drinking angels baseball from a fire hose. I just got this job five minutes ago. And so I love that you asked me that question. I don't even know who made the tournament. I know Gonzaga's good. And trust me, I called Mountain West games up to about three weeks ago and Pac-12 games. I was down in Tucson calling Sean Miller's team on TV, like right. three or four. I know they're out of the dance, but I got no idea who's doing anything, nor will I ever have any idea who's doing anything. I have so much homework to do and catching up. I got nothing on this year's March Madness. Check back with me in 2022. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll write that down. And you mentioned you got the homework. You got to kind of catch up with the last, you know, how many seasons and, and new players that are coming in and stuff like that. So obviously Mike Trout is Mike Trout. Everyone knows who he is, you know, whether you're an Angel fan or not. But other than him, who is someone that you're really interested in watching this year? Ooh, that's a great question. I think I'm interested most in watching. I love pitching, and I think I'm interested most in watching Jose Quintana and understanding who he may continue to be. I know he's not elite. I know he's not going to you know, go 220 innings and strike out 260. I just think there's a couple of guys in that spot because there's a bunch of threes in that rotation. Mm -hmm. And a guy like that that can be dependable, that you know, even he, he's proud of sharing his social media when he throws well. I love that. For an older guy. Um, so I'm intrigued to watch him. I react to offense. I don't know offense. I pitched in the minor leagues. My father pitched forever. I, I, I'm intrigued by pitching and I react to offense. I'll listen to Jose and Mark a lot about offense. I go more with the numbers. I don't know the, what I'm looking at like they do. Um, obviously, Mike is special. Uh, you know, I get to call his games. I've had special players in special seasons. You know, Brandon Webb with the Diamondbacks when he won a Cy Young years back. Ben, a young Ben Sheets with the Brewers. Um, you know, even some of those those Erstad years when he had 240 hits in a season, yeah. those are those are seasons that I've I've cherished. Like I'll never forget those three guys in specific um, that I've been able to call. And Mike's I've never, but Mike's kind of next level. Like right. my dad's a Hall of Famer, and Mike's above that. And so, <laughs> for, so for that, I'm excited. You know, I'm a Justin Upton fan. I was his game caller when he broke into the big leagues. Um, so I'm a fan, like I'm a personal fan. He's giving back to youth baseball. He and his brother and his dad give a ton back. So my team does better if he does better. Let's start right. with that. But on the personal side, I want Justin to have a hell of a year, man. I, I really, I'm, I'm glad it's a good spring, but I'm really excited as, as getting in his twilight years, if you will. I hope he has a really good year. 
So one of the things I like to ask people, especially in, in your situation, um, you know, I've asked Gooby this the first time we had him on, I asked this to, to Victor the first time we had it on. What is the best advice you got from someone when coming through this business? Wow. Um, and it's and it's advice that I pass along. It, it's be a good be a good partner. It's understand that all your work and all your research is important, but you've got to be a good partner and listen to your analyst. Pete Van Weeren, the late Pete Van Weeren, shared that with me when I was, you know, pick pick picking at him a lot when I'd come visit, and um, he shared that with me, and, and it and it really resonated with me. I watched him work with my dad. I watched him work with Joe Simpson. And those guys had the same attitude, though. It was it was given back. But Pete realized, like, I can read anything I want and look anything I want up. But think about it, right? You and I can look up the same things on the Internet. I don't mm -hmm. have a different Internet than you. You know, right. I, it's, yeah. so I, I need those two guys. I need those two guys to really make the show good because you and I can look up. The, I'm not going to tell you anything that you can't look <laughs> up. I'm not. Um, so I think the advice from Pete Manwer and I've always lived by, I, again, I've, I've worked with Bill Schroeder, a great catcher with the Brewers. I've worked with Mark Grace, who was amazing. With the Angels, I worked with Mario and Pemba, who still is like a big brother and a mentor to me. So I've had great partners, and that advice has been easy to carry through. But where that advice has helped has been, you know, when I'm doing wrestling at the, at the Pac-12 championships or breaking in a brand new analyst for a Pac-12 volleyball game or a soccer game. That's where that's really helped. I, I cherish the teamwork that goes into doing a game. That's great advice for anyone. You know, maybe someone's listening to this and, and thinking about that kind of a career, but that's great advice. And I, I love the passion behind it. So, Darren, I want to thank you again for taking time out and out with, with me on the All Angels podcast. If you want to follow Darren on Twitter, go ahead and give him a follow at Life is Great Sut um, on Twitter with you know the season obviously right around the corner uh opening day you got opening day call correct i do have the opening day yeah. call i'll have the freeway series the opening day and and then maddie will jump in not too far after we're kind of gonna i think we'll end up going about 50 50 this year it's nice. gonna be a lot of fun awesome darren i i can't wait to hear you um like the, the freeway series like you mentioned but definitely opening day when when everything is on the line and it, and it starts for real i'll be there my friend thanks for having me on